Through a Scottish Prism, the programme that is unapologetically pro-Scottish independence and anti-Westminster rule. Everything we say here is viewed through a Scottish Prism. Brought to you by Barhead Boy. Hi folks, welcome back to Through a Scottish Prism. Uh, it's lovely to be with you again. I hope you and yours are well. I'm sick of saying this, but it's been a hell of a week. I, I mean, we have had a, an absolute... <laughs> A humdinger of a week this week. Um, and so we've got lots to talk about, lots to discuss. Um, and, you know, you've all been, social media's been a, on fire. Um, I'm sure there's discussions in pubs everywhere and whatnot and at the bus stop because it's a hell of a mess. And let's see if we can get some sense out of it or if we can get some direction out of anything out of it um, that improves Scotland's position. So to help me out, I should say right away, Mr. Boswell is unable to join us tonight, which is regrettable, but he will be back, as he always is. He's like the bad penny. He keeps coming back. Um, but we've got our a favourite lawyer, as always. Eva, how are you? Hi, Roddy. It's been some week. Eh? It's been a week of bookmarks and no marks and cheeky remarks. And I, I don't know what's going on in Scottish political life just now. You, you can't imagine from one day to the next what all the different twists and turns will be, but Hopefully we'll be able to have some in-depth, rational, sensible and rather cheeky analysis tonight. Looking forward to it. Absolutely. And we've got our, our, our man from Edinburgh. It's our Lloyd. Mr Quinn, how the heck are you? <laughs> Where are we? Groundhog Day, deja vu, back to the future. It's just it's insanity, just insanity. Indeed, but thankfully Br Branchbond didn't make any arrests this week. If they could do that, if you could do that next week, lads, that would be next week's programme taken care of, possibly a couple of weeks. Um, it would be great, but they have lots to do. And I've also got with joining us Derek Kerr, the Independent for Independence candidate in Edinburgh East. Derek, welcome back. We only had you for a short time last time, so we were determined to get you back as soon as possible. Welcome. Good to be here again. Can't wait to... Um discuss the shenanigans of the past week or so because there's a fair bit to get through. Oh, for sure. Well, I would say that we, we also I put an invite out to the uh, to the Alapa party to say that obviously they've been a wee bit centre stage this week and uh, I thought it would be fair to have one of their, someone that they represent, one of their representatives sent on here, one, someone of their choice to speak up or for them or explain their position. They declined, they ignored, they ignored the request. I know they read the request because those of you who were WhatsApp had the two blue ticks mm. and it went to someone who could have replied but didn't give me the courtesy of a reply, even a off Roddy. I didn't even get that. I feel hot. I wasn't even worth a off, but there you go. What can I say? Eva, we've lost the First Minister. We've got a new one coming that we've had before. Um, we've had someone who we thought was going to, who ran for it before, but didn't run for it this time. Um, it's quite a week. And another one who ran for it, who voted with the opposition. Where to start? I think we'll start with Humes's resignation. Um, when he resigned, I, I mean, he had a, 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 we heard that he tried to do a deal with Alapa. Um, and when that didn't go through, um, it, but, but who rejected it? Him? Or the people, the puppeteers, who do you think? Well, I was actually quite offended that Humza said one of the reasons for his resignation was that he realised that he'd hurt the feelings of the Greens. Oh, yeah. And their hurt feelings are as of nothing in comparison to the damage and the chaos that the Greens as a party have wrought in Scotland over the course of the past few years when they've been given powers, control, and financial um, spending abilities far beyond the wildest imagination of most of the population. They were elected from the list on a handful of votes, and the influence that they've had over Scotland in the last couple of years has been beyond recognition. Um, they are responsible for most of the mistakes that have been made in government, and they're responsible for hurting the feelings uh, to a pretty dramatic extent of 51% of the population being the women that they discounted. I, I know we'll go into that particular matter later, but certainly I was offended that the Greens were offended at being sacked from jobs that they should never have had in the first place. Uh, mm -hmm. And it was a pity that, that they had, I think, gone to Butte House by car because it left them having to leave on foot. 
but I'm looking forward to seeing Patrick touring about Edinburgh on his bike again as opposed to in a chauffeur-driven limousine. Um, however, um, you were asking particularly about Alba and Ash Reagan. I wonder if she regrets leaving the SNP and joining Alba because the indications seem to be that Joanna Cherry is supportive of Kate Forbes, who in turn is supportive of John Swinney. And I wonder if that suggests that some of the principled reasons <clears throat> leaving the SNP and joining ALBA are matters that will be revisited by the SNP over the course of the next couple of years prior to the next Holyrood election. In a way, I'd like to think so, but the cynic in me suggests otherwise. Um, and who are, the, who are the puppeteers? The Greens will continue uh, to dictate and influence outcomes because by no stretch of the imagination can I see that John Swinney, if he does become the leader and the first minister in a coronation, will actually have the ability to run a minority government the way that his predecessor, Alex Salmond, did. Hmm. Uh, Lloyd, I mean, as an ex Alipa member, I can only say, I know that, I can only imagine, because I say we couldn't get them on here to say it, but the deal must have been, they wanted to uh, prior, prioritise independence, protect women's rights, and to protect children from harm, safeguard children. What possible part of that could Humza not agree to? I think uh, I think immediately it became known uh, to certain elements of the SNP leadership that Humza was even going to speak to the Alpa party. Then a series of events were put in train to make sure that he uh, he was finished. Um, I find it extraordinary that the offer being good government, moving on independence and the protection of women and girls are not priorities for the incoming potential leader, uh, because that's what that's what killed the deal. John Swinney's hands are not clean on killing the deal. I, mean, I very firmly believe that Nicola Sturgeon had a major part in, in killing any deal as well. But in, in real terms, what difference would it have made? Uh, Hamza was a dead man walking. He proved his ineptitude as a first minister uh, in the fact that he had to apologise for having hurt the feelings of the Greens, having not perceived that in actual fact doing what he did to them would result in them having hurty feelings, because hurty feelings are the most important thing in politics in the world of the Greens. Uh, it showed his inability, but it also, I think, I think <laughs> Hamza had had his shot and things were going to hell in a handcart. And I think powers beyond our borders decided that uh, his tenure was over and it was time to retake the reins. And that's clearly what has happened, because if you if you even suggested in the year 2004 or five that John Swinney would return as the as the leader of the Scottish National Party, never mind First Minister, uh, people would have laughed their socks off. That's simply a fact. John was a terrible leader. The party was was damaged enormously in the election he was in charge of, and then when challenged for the leadership. Uh, Alex Salmond had to come back from Westminster and, and effectively save the party and give us good government, which which we had. What I see here is the, the, the dark hands of others, but there is a kind of uh, silver lining to this cloud. There is, uh, I'll make an appeal now. There's a guy called Graham McCormick, a very fine Scottish nationalist from the mm -hmm. Helensborough branch of the Scottish National Party, who is currently gathering signatures, so it will make it possible for him to create a proper contest and that the party membership will have an ability and uh, the power to choose the next the next leader if he gets sufficient signatures. Uh, and I would just say to people, if you can contact me or Graham on social media, let us know if you wish to sign those papers to allow Graham to go ahead as a candidate in the SNP leadership race, then please, please do that. The only possibility of saving the party at this stage uh, would be for someone else to become the leader of the party, uh, not John Swinney. John made a terrible job of it the last time. And I think, you know, when you when you juxtapose John's presentation to an extreme right-wing Tory think tank in London uh, at the beginning of the week, 
and then suddenly his announcement that he was going to return not only to frontline politics, which he had decided he wasn't going to do anymore, uh, gives you gives you a pretty clear understanding of uh, where John takes his orders from. <laughs> yeah, and if you haven't already read Campbell Martin's book, folks, I would do that. Um, I've forgotten the title of it. What is it again, Lloyd? Do you remember? Was it something that I said? Was it something that I said? Exactly, that's what it is. Um, but that was the things you said. He was he was a right wing unionist think tank when he made his announcement about running. What was he doing down there? He was talking about enhancing devolution, folks, not independence. Now you, you know this is Sunday. The, the the nominations close on Monday, so you're going to have to move quick if you're going to support Graham. Now Graham's been on this show. I had a long discussion with him about floor roof uh, tax, um, which led to a, a motion uh, passed at the Alapa conference. He's a very clever man, um, and is if nothing else, it will get a debate, and people can ask questions of uh, of John Swinney, like for example, the one that he dodged when he was asked yesterday, "What is a woman?" Couldn't answer that one. Um, on on the, all of this, uh, what was expected, Derek, was that Kate Forbes would make a competition of it, that she would uh, throw her hat in the ring, but she quickly backed away. Her capitulation was it the, or you know, people, the puppeteers came to her and said, "No, the Greens have said they'll pull us down if you become leader, so you can't, and we'll give you this, that, and the next thing." Do you think there was uh, something on offer, or is could there be another reason why she suddenly now not want to run for the leadership of the party when she did only a year ago? Yeah, but, um, you mean Kate, Kate Forbes, yeah? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, I mean, she's got, she's got a family going on in the background, so there is a bit of that pulling her back and that kind of thing. Um, but then I, I, I just don't think she wants to grab the beast at the moment because um, I mean she was in a situation where she's failed as a as a potential leader you know just recently and for her to politically or career wise you know entertain that possibility that she might fail to take the leadership again it'd be too many failures too close together and maybe that's a, it's maybe just too big a risk for a, a you know, a, pol a career politician to take. Um, but, uh, I mean, beyond that, the whole the whole lot of them, you know, if I had to pick anyone from the SNP to, to, to lead or anything like that, it would have to be someone that knows the truth behind Freeports and somebody that, um, that, that, that's got the... The, the courage to stand up and Lloyd really Quinnan. There you go. The Lloyd Quinnan. Exactly. Lloyd's my man. <laughs> I'll vote for him, all right. So, uh, yeah, but I, I think that's the kind of situation we're in. So that, all this kind of background with them all, uh, it's squabbles. It's, it's, it's playground squabbles. It's, it's personal stuff. And to be honest, Eyes on the price. We need to get Indy done and we need to get free ports out the road so we can do it. And anybody that stands in that, that top job in the in the driver's seat that can bring us anywhere closer to that is the person I want on that podium. So what are, waiting, what are you waiting for, Lloyd? <laughs> mm -hmm. Derek, can I just say on your point about, you know, maybe she didn't want to be seen, you know, failing again because she would never become leader. But surely on this occasion where she's not, she's not stepped up to the plate, she's actually probably ended any chance she's ever got to be leader because she's lacked the courage to step forward. So surely she's now, by her actions, finished her, her future chances as well. Yeah, uh, whatever, whichever way she jumped, really, I think unless she jumped and was elected, then, yeah, I think I think she was, she was down whichever way she, she jumped because, um, you know, did, how much of a chance would you had against John Swinney? I... I'd probably put it about 40, 60 um, in well, John's we'll, favour. I think we'll talk in that because I think, you know, I don't think John, there's a chance John might not last very long. I don't. I think there's a chance John might not actually even become leader. But as the programme goes on, we'll, we'll explain that. 
Because okay. it's an anointing, obviously, Eva. It's not really, there's not going to be, you know, I hope Graham can get his, his 100, 100 signatures in in time, but it's looking like an anointing. But here's just two or three things that have come out this week. Swinney himself was meant to be standing down. He said a few months back he was not going to stand in 26. He's now told us that for seven years he's been trying to leave the government and Sturgeon said to him, no, you're not. He couldn't stand up to Sturgeon. So how the hell can you expect him to stand up to the unions and get his independence? Look, this is just game playing and role playing and it's kicking the can further down the road. Um, we knew last year that John Swinney ruled himself out from the contest that led to Hamza becoming elected because John said at that stage that he was already too old and it was time for young blood in a different generation. <laughs> so I want to know his secret and how he's been able to be rejuvenated in the course of the past year and where he's getting his newly found longevity from. Um, if what he's really saying is that he's sacrificing himself and his family life for the sake of the party, I have grave reservations as to whether that's a wise move, particularly in the light of his own tweet when he said he was ready to serve. He has quite a lengthy tweet explaining about the work that he's done in government and what he looks forward to doing. And throughout that tweet, there is no mention whatsoever of the word independence. And that's very, very telling. And I think that that gives credence to the problems that there would have been for the SNP to enter even some sort of informal alliance with the ALBA party because there are strong indications that independence is not presently the raison d'etre or the priority or the primary purpose of the SNP, as seen most obviously in their con constant rejection of the notion of the Scotland United plan for the general election. So I have a, a, a very major difficulty in accepting that John Swinney intends to drive Scotland anywhere closer to independence than we currently are. And in fact, he contradicted Hamza Youssef in his speech when he announced his, his contesting um, for the leadership. You remember Hamza said that he thought independence was frustratingly close. John said that he didn't agree with us and he wanted to conduct over the next couple of years a persuasion exercise. Now, I'm scratching my head here because I can't understand that the current and the would-be First Ministers can be so very many poles apart on, as we've said, what is supposed to be the priority of their party. So what ought to be happening, as Derek has alluded to, is a drive towards independence where we have independence for independence, we have candidates from all party and no party, and we have real unity in the movement. Now, John Swinney's um, motto, I think, at his launch was something along the lines of unity for independence. And he spoke about uniting his party and he spoke about uniting the movement. He isn't going to unite the movement if he rejects other independent supporting parties. And again, for the life of me, I cannot understand why he would pay attention to or his predecessors would pay attention to the Greens and their views when they, the Greens are going to stand against the SNP for the general election. And the Greens have often said independence is not a red line for them, and yet Alba, whose raison d'etre is independence, offered them a leg up and they knocked it back. It makes no sense, except that they want to keep Alex Salmond out of the road. And the joke, the joke, unfortunately, is on John, because for the last few years since Alba launched, and everybody here knows I'm no longer a member of Alba, but I still maintain a huge amount of admiration for Alec and Kenny and Neil in particular, People in the SNP have constantly referred to Alex Salmond as yesterday's man. What is John Swinney but yesterday's man? But Alex Salmond is the man that got the referendum. Alex Salmond is the man that Westminster feared. They don't fear John Swinney. And that may be the reason why John Swinney is lined up for the job and has been talking about a persuasion exercise over the next two years when everybody and the dogs in the street know there is a majority in Scotland desirous of independence and desirous yeah. of an electoral event when we can vote for it. Well, it's quite so. The reason why I said earlier, Lloyd, that there's a chance you might not even become First Minister or not last very long. There's an article, I meant to keep the article, but I haven't done it. I was just checking with Techie there. I didn't, I thought I, thought I had sent it to Techie. And it was one that came out, albeit from the Express, but they were bringing up the Gupta and they were, they were smearing that. John Swinney with that. So they're already getting ready to attack him. 
And how long, and we've also seen coming out, um, the one of his, when he was education section, he was in Perth, and they were talking about the, the stuff that John had approved as education secretary to go into to schools. So the unionist media are warming up. But here's another one. You were there at the time. Kecky, can you stick up the one that's, or another one that's reappeared from, from yesterday? You'll remember this one. Um, the one with Dorothy Grace Elder, when she referred to him as sly, sleek and weak man. The honest John um, really is. Um, you were around at that time. Was Dorothy Grace Elder exaggerating? Absolutely not. Everything that Dorothy says is absolutely true. And in some ways, John gets off lightly because she doesn't go into detail. But what happened when Alex stood down and, and John took over as leader, he was supported by all of those who later went on to become the lieutenants of uh, Mrs. Murrow. My time then was, uh, I would say, I, would, I was pretty semi-detached from the parliamentary group, primarily because of John's behaviour and John's actions. Um, the marginalisation of Dorothy was one thing, but the vicious and brutal marginal marginalisation of Margot MacDonald, to me, was, it was a crime against the country. It was yeah. the actions of craven cowards who feared an intellect, they feared someone who had the mass, as she proved when she stood as a, an independent at the following election, who had the mass of the people behind her. In actual fact, when, when Margot stood in, as an independent on the Lothian's list, if there had been two Margot McDonald's, they both would have been elected. That's mm. the fact. And the vast majority of the votes that went to Margot on the second ballot paper were SNP votes because for real members of the Scottish National Party, Margot was a hero. And it disgusted me to have to walk the corridors with people who were barely able to lace her shoes, who, who said things against her to the press, who carried out a vicious and brutal whispering campaign and even leaked details of her medical condition. All of this was in John's knowledge at the time. John will brook no challenge whatsoever, but John's so politically illiterate, he didn't realize that the people who were his lieutenants were the ones that were primarily, primarily, they were the ones who were briefing against him. And that's why John failed as a leader and it paved the way for Miss Sturgeon after Alec. John is, a, John is a desperately, desperately weak man and his only way that he can show what he believes is strength is by the total marginalisation of anyone who doesn't think like John. John is a direct product of the standard life management training organisations. He, he believes that when you have status, everyone else should bow to it. He never ever believes there's a requirement to win respect. John thinks when you get a title, respect comes with it. And that is the sign of a desperately, desperately weak individual. The terrible, the terrible situation we have here now is there are pages, pages, files and files of John's ineptitude from his period as leader the last time. The unionist press are going to have a total and complete field day with John. He's going yeah. to get very little sleep and I feel sorry for his family. But I would say this, it's interesting. Hamza Youssef, product of the International Visitor, Visiting Leaders Programme of the US State Department, was our first minister for a year and made a complete cack of it. Then when he announces he's going, he's, he's going to be stepping away, the first name that came into the frame was another IVLP graduate, Jenny Gilruth. It's interesting now though, that what we have is a contest where she will take no part. But those who are part of the British American partnership, namely John Swinney and Kate Forbes, they have emerged into the light. Is this the, as I would see it, is this the British state reasserting itself after allowing the Americans to run our country for about a year? Now, I know that will sound strange to a lot of people, but you tell me, anybody out there tell me, why is it? 
Why is it that members of the Scottish Parliament, members of the Scottish National Party, are deliberately recruited by the British-American Partnership and the International Visiting Leaders Programme of the United States State Department unless they wish to interfere in our politics? John, you're not the answer, and you know you're not the answer. And what I fear is this is all being set up for a move away, which I've been saying for a while, the current leadership are a devolutionist leadership. They just haven't got the courage yet to tell the people. Hmm. It is the worry. Um, do you think, Derek, that uh, John has been put in place by those who are working behind the scenes to keep things ticking over to whoever their selection is, is brought forward maybe after the, whole, after the Westminster debacle that's coming our way? Or do Absolutely, you think yeah. it's genuine? Do you think that's what it is? Yeah, I mean, I did think, you know, we're looking at a placeholder here. I mean, who's going to come along in the background? They just they just don't have the talent. There's no one there that can come in the background. So, um, you know, a, a placeholder probably, but... I'm just thinking that he might be around for a little bit longer than we expect. Unless, of course, he's hacked down. Because, as you say, he's going to get a really hard time from the um, the cuckoos in the nest. All of them are going to just give him an absolute kicking. And I, I, I really hope he's strong enough to stand up and take that. And then, and, and if he's strong enough, he could probably actually use it to throw it back in their face. And um, and talk about the company that they keep, um, the uh, everything that they you know everything they say you know he's got to, he's got to be saying you know, how are you going to fund it, and and and, ask, and really put the ball back in their court, and hopefully he's got the the strength and the wit to do that. Otherwise, that placeholder is not going to be around for very long. So that, that's my very you top level overview on the situation because um, you guys have got an awful lot more um, knowledge about the real nitty gritty depth of it than I than I do. Um, you know, I'm I'm more a person looking forward. I mean, all that shenanigans has gone on on the side. It's, it's a sideshow. Um, you know, let, let's get indie done really, um, and hopefully this whole sideshow will blow over eventually. And then um, you know what John does and, or doesn't do, um, really, the, the politicians have had their day. <laughs> you know, it's he, he's a dead man walking, I think. Yeah, what, what I find quite, I mean, I mean the, the, one of the big problems is that a lot of the people who are running the SNP now are the ones that arrived post-2014. And um, as we've spoken about often in this show, they don't have any knowledge or history of the, the pre, of this party going back to those of us who, like Eva, myself, Lloyd here, who have tramped the streets over decades ago and know what happened. But the one that surprises me is Angus Robertson. When he arrived at Hollywood, we all thought it was because he was being lined up to to succeed the, the despot Sturgeon. But he's gone kind of quiet. Maybe we should have a chat about him later. If I can move on just slightly, Eva. Um, one of the things, we all left, when you and I left and a few others left the SNP after decades of loyal service, um, we, we've taken some amount of abuse, particularly from these newbies, from these Johnny-come-latelys who um, have abused us and uh, they've abused Alex Salmon, they've abused the Alaba party, they, they've refused when we all, when the Alaba party said Alba 1, SNP 2, they would no beat it when they said uh, the council elections the following year. You know, SNP first and then all the other independent candidates, they went, no, just SNP one, two. The, when they said Scotland United, come on, let's all get together. It's Scotland United for Scotland. No, we're not doing it. And then when Ash Reagan votes against them, they're all going, oh, how can you do that to us? The hypocrisy is absolutely mind-blowing. And they don't understand the policy of the Alaba party. I think that those in the SNP who are gurning about Ash voting the way that she did simply don't understand what independence is all about. Mm. And they don't grasp the urgent necessity of an independence campaign. They're not capable of running an independence campaign. They've proven that over the course of the last 
what, nine and a half, ten years or so. We should have had an independence campaign in 2015 when we had 56 out of 59 MPs from Scotland were SNP. But now that we strongly suspect that devolution or devo max is probably John Swinney's priority and the priority of those around him, then we have to look ever more carefully at what can be done with the people who actually do prioritise independence. And those are folk like Derek here and me and Sally Hughes who are independent or independence candidates. And it's important to look to see what's happened recently in by-elections here as well as south of the border relative to the popularity of independent candidates, particularly those who live and work in the area or the constituency where they intend to stand. I'm one of those, I understand Derek is, and I know that Sally Hughes is too. And I think that that used to be the beauty of the SNP, that they generally had candidates who were local, who knew their area, who worked in their area, and who were on first name terms with an awful lot of the people whose votes they were asking for. That changed over a period of time. And it's actually most marked with some of those who are currently in the Scottish Cabinet. I mean, Hamza Yusuf in particular, he's constituent, he's Glasgow, but he lives in Brotty Ferry. Um, and I, I was laughing the other day when they said that he had travelled to Dundee for a press conference. He could have jumped on a bus and been travelled for his mm -hmm. home to the press conference in the space of five minutes. Um, however, I digress slightly. What we should be doing is we should be talking within the movement about how to invigorate and inspire the movement again. And, and I'm hoping that by the time this goes out on Sunday, people will have enjoyed a, a great day at the All Under One Banner um, March and Rally in Glasgow. And what we should have is a, a touch of what Jim Sillers talks about, competent government on the one hand with a party leading the government, holding things together and promoting and prioritising the bread and butter issues of the people of the country and separately an invigorated, energised, determined movement of people who are like-minded, who are able to put their differences behind them and talk sensibly about how to prioritise Scotland's need to drive towards independence. And the way to do that is to look at this general election in a holistic fashion and in a positive fashion and really encourage the electorate to, to stand up and be counted this time by actually saying, let's vote for folk who do want independence because it runs through them like, you know, a stalk of Edinburgh rock. Um, and I, I hope that that is able to be gained over this summer and that we will have more independent candidates standing up because we cannot wait for a couple of years for the SNP to get their act together for a Holyrood election or for ALBA or the ISP to be able to get more of their candidates elected in 2026. We should be doing it now in 24 and setting the marker down, setting the standard down and electing 29 independent supporting MPs to Westminster. And that gives us, as we've said before, a majority of MPs and a majority of the popular vote. And these two aspects take us to the international community who will recognise our right to then negotiate the terms of the independent settlement Nothing less will do. And the only thing that's preventing that happening this year are the interests of partisan party politicians yeah. who refuse to look at unity for our country. Yeah, it's, it's always that. It's always putting the party before the, the country, Lloyd. But here's two things on Ash. Is, well, the, the thing is that the SNP, uh, the Alipa party policy, um, which I don't think has changed since I left, um, was that was to collapse the Holyrood. Parliament, you know, for the, the First Minister to resign, as happened, and then not to elect a new one, to have a plebiscite, have a Scotland United, a, Scot a constitutional convention, and have a plebiscite independence election, because the polls, unlike what John Swinney is saying this week, oh, we need to convert more soft nose, it's there. Uh, and so that was one of the reasons why I should know no alternative, but there, here's the other one. Just a few days before the, the vote, those of you following on social media, uh, Stu Campbell the, of Wings Over Scotland made it very clear that what's the point that he's he put money his tweets almost verbatim. I think if I can get it wrong, I'm sure Mr. Campbell will let me know. Um, what's the point of Alba if they support and keep the SNP in government and don't do carry through their policy? Um, and it would seem, I don't know what, whether they were carrying the policy or they were scared of the backlash from Stu Campbell. Um, 
But that's the fact. The policy dictated that she had to vote against the SNP government and try and bring down the parliament. Absolutely. And, and what did she do wrong? We have an incompetent government. Mm -hmm. That's just a fact. That's why there is a 13 or 14 percent gap between those who support independence and those who support the Scottish National Party. It's because they've become incompetent. And the motion was about the competence of the government. In, in all conscience, she could only vote in one particular way. But this is the world we're living in, where these, these, these amateur politicians put their fingers in the ears whenever their party is criticised, rather than doing what used to happen in real political parties, like the Scottish National Party used to be, that would result in soul searching. You would actually have a debate, internal debate, about what went wrong and how to get it fixed. But let me go back to, to, to something that Eva just said. Now, look, it has become the common kind of parlance that it's 50-50 for independence, right? We went to the country when support for independence was at 27% and we took it up by over 20 points in a year's campaign. Does anybody genuinely believe that the 50% that say they're pro-union at this very second, supposedly, will not shift in that position? That we will not be able to make 50, 60 or 65% if we had a proper campaign? I mean, the, the, the press, and to some degree, I hear it from SNP politicians all the time, oh, it's 50-50, we have to wait until we're at 60. Well, see, the way you get to 60 is you have a hmm. campaign. And we've yep. not had a campaign for nine years. And the simple fact of the matter is, anyone who's in politics who thinks that a party that for 70-odd years has been telling the people that they support and they want and they aim for independence, that those people will not go out and vote when the SNP actually campaigns for independence. They are idiots. But then again, you know, if, 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 you do not, if you do not understand your history, either as a political party, as a football team, as a country, as a family, then you're going to make the same mistakes over and over and over again. And at the moment, amongst the pre professional political class in Scotland, there is an absolute desire to reject all history. History began with a alarm clock this morning. Hence, when you go on to the Scottish National Party's website as a member, apparently the Scottish National Party didn't have a leader between 2007 and 2014. There was no leader at that time. Nobody built the Queen's Ferry Crossing. Nobody built the, the motorway in Glasgow. Nobody built the Ring Road in Aberdeen. None of these things happened. Nobody got rid of tuition fees. Nobody brought in free dental and eye checks. Nobody brought in prescription charges. Because shit sure it wasn't the bunch that are in there now. Now, any party, any organisation that tries to deny its own history when the reality is the population out there, the people that you want to go and vote for you, they know very well who your leader was between 2007 and 2014. And no matter how often you put your head in the sand or your fingers in your ears, it's a reality. And the mm. Kelly Givens of this world and the Alistair Heathers of this world can get back in their wee boxes. Absolutely. I mean, that is the problem, Derek, isn't it? They do live in a wee bubble. I mean, when I listened to John Swinney talking about, oh, we have to convince more soft nose, it's not there yet. I thought, absolute balderdash. Every week on here we are talking about, you know, every poll has been showing independence over 50% for well over a year now. In fact, we must be heading on 18 months. And meanwhile, the SNP's dropping, dropping, dropping. There can be no better way for them to bring their support back up again, surely, than having an independence campaign. Absolutely. It's a campaign. It's something to fight for and, um, and, and, and run towards that everyone needs. Um, this running about in circles just in case something might happen is just... It's just it's just wearing people out and wearing people down. Um, I mean the, the, the SNP, the bubble. I mean they're, they're talking to themselves about themselves, and that's more at the upper levels of the SNP. I mean until recently, I'd been I'd been going to branch meetings, and um, one of the reasons I had to step back from the SNP was because of the absolute 
blind follow my leader sheep approach to free ports. Um, I, for months and months and months, have been going on at my branch level, at my branch, to say I need some time on the agenda to really get into the weeds of the detail of what we've not been told about free ports. And then um, one month went on, the, the minutes were, were watered down, and then um, I was told that you know I'd have my slot the following month. Never happened. And then what I was going to say was then rolled into a, um, a, a, a little slot that was attached to the economy, a little, a little side issue to which I said, no, 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 no. This issue is so big that the yeah. SNP needs an EGM just on this topic. And you're pushing me into a, a sideshow to do with a small talk about economics. Economically literate people talking about economics. <laughs> what can I say? Uh, and then, so the next month rolled on, and then the people that were going to come and debate it ran away. And um, now, what was his name? Um, Douglas Chapman. Douglas Chapman, yeah. He has been invited to so many of the meetings that I have been involved in setting up and he's not come, and he was all enthusiastic at one point, but I think maybe on his desk was this little bullet point that said free ports, or green ports, whatever they want to call them, and um, I I don't think that you actually realised the enormity of just that little bullet point, until mm -hmm. people started asking, I'm saying, listen, come along and chat to us about free ports, and let's, um, let's get into the weeds of these things, um, and it just never happened, and then he was all, as I say, all enthusiastic, and all of a sudden he just completely backed off. I think somebody in the party got to him and started saying, no, 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 you can't be talking to these people about that because we've gone all in with this and we're going to be looking really silly if we... But, then, you know, the people will forgive if they were to put their hands up and say, we've not really looked at the detail of this and we really need to do that and we need to have a discussion about it. Um, with the people of Scotland and the and the uh, grassroots people in the SNP, because there are so many people in the grassroots that are beginning to understand this and really, really want to say something, and they're getting slapped down at um, mm -hmm. branch level. So that's been yeah. my recent experience. Um, and why you left? The SNP and why? Yeah, why I've now left. Yeah, I mean, there's two things. I mean, the other things they're always about. Oh, we're going to get uh, free ports are great. We're going to get back into the EU, and we're going to use the pound sterling. Uh, well, can I just come right in? And, can I just come right in in there about the bit that says we'll get into the EU and all the rest of it? There is a fundamental flaw right there. And it, yes, you, of course there is. There's two and, and, fundamental flaws. One's free ports, and the other one's the, the, the pound sterling. Exactly. Yeah. So the free ports that we're given are owned by. Uh, private enterprises and a lot of those private enterprises have came in bank accounts and you know they're they're set up um, as llps and things like that um, and they're faceless um and that is in direct contravention with the anti-money laundering laws that the european union have brought in so yep. under those circumstances now the free ports in europe they are publicly owned for the people, by the people, essentially. And then um, as long as we have these private entities and these um, free um, special economic zones that are basically just hoovering up taxpayers' money and pushing it down to Westminster, we don't have a snowball's chance in hell of even getting to EFTA, never mind Europe. So that's the bottom line on that one. Correct. The two questions you should the questions you should never be asking SNP people is what is a free port and what is a woman? That they run away from those two questions as quick as they bloody can. Um there's also coming out this week, and I, I go back to I think it's going to build up on John Swinney as uh, things go on either. But apparently he produced a paper while he was in fin when he was the finance minister or cabinet secretary, whatever the hell they call it, where um he was going to sell off Caledonian McBrain and Scottish water, and it was rejected. Um, there's boys nodding in agreement. Um, so now that he's the first minister, he can push that through. 
How will the Scottish people take it if he sells off Scottish water? Um, I hesitate to state to say this, but I would like to think that there would be demonstrations and riots in the streets if he tries to introduce mm. that one. But when I look back over the course of the last few years and see all the other crazy policies that he's had a hand in, I hate my dukes. Um, but I'm just thinking there from what, what Derek was talking about in terms of the people would be forgiving if the politicians apologised and admitted that they'd made mistakes. That's actually the road to redemption and rehabilitation for the SNP as if they did put their hands up and admit their mistakes. But there's a very, very long line of them. Um, and only a few would be the named person legislation, gender mm -hmm. recognition reform, obviously, oh, the deposit terrible. return scheme, the hate Shopping. crime act, the carry on with wood burning stoves, green oh, free yeah. court, issues about the EU and EFTA, transgender guidance for schools, um, men and women's prisons, men and women's hospital wards, um, guidance to social workers, children's panels, reporters and teachers about affirming um, trans children as opposed to other uh, watchful waiting resources, etc. Um, Grangemouth. The Scottish Government has known for at least a year of plans that there are there in relation to keeping the refinery closed and not repairing or reopening or renewing it. And they seem to have done absolutely nothing about it. Um, it's obviously to Kenny McCaskill and Elvis credit that they've been very vociferous about this. But it is well beyond time that the SNP actually stood up for the majority of the people of Scotland and considered what their priorities are. We're in the midst of that cost of living crisis, a cost of fuel crisis. We had that reverse wind auction. If Grangemouth closes, we're watching oil and, you know, going south to be refined. We're looking at the issues that come from wind and wave power being, in essence, exported to England as opposed to coming on shore here. These are all areas that the Scottish Government, the SNP in particular, should be addressing, and they're not. Instead, they're talking constantly about how one of the great things that they've achieved in the last few years is to remove 100,000 Scottish children from poverty. That is a good thing, but nobody in Scotland should be living in poverty given that we're a land of plenty. And the only way that we address po poverty properly is by becoming independent. And there are people in our country who do not have the luxury of waiting for two or five or ten years for the SNP or other political parties to get their act together and create the circumstances that they think are ideal to make a move. Sometimes you've got to take the circumstances that are delivered to you and you make the best of them and you go for it because you're flexible and you're fly and you've got a vision and you're focused and you're determined to do something good for your country. These conditions are upon us now in the context of fighting a general election on the ground of independence, on our ground, on Scottish ground, where we say collectively to the Scottish people as a movement, thus far have we come and we will go further when we unite and we vote for our independence in large numbers, which we'll do if all parties and no parties come together like they can do at All Under One Banner and the likes. Here, here. Well said, Eva. Um, of course, when this, as soon as uh, Humes announced his, uh, his, uh, his resignation, uh, Lloyd, Rishi Shunak um the the overlord down in london put a message well i hope his successor just stops talking or focusing on independence yeah well i didn't know the, i didn't know he was focusing on anyone's been focusing on it for 10 years Rishi, but never mind but the best thing for me was a uh, ticket going to stick up the video of starmer um and him talking about what should happen next now there's a right, an so unelected uh, to the uk economy why do you support us continuing to stay outside the eu we took a decision on leaving the EU in 2016, and we have now left. There is no case for returning to the EU. Because it was the will of the people. We had a vote on it. See, here's the problem with that argument, that there's, there's a, a party that stood with another vote on Scottish independence at the centre of its manifesto in the last Scottish elections, and they won at an absolute canter. It was the will of the people to have a referendum on independence within the term of this parliament up here, and you say that shouldn't happen. Why do you protect democracy across the UK but deny it to well, the people of Scotland? Choice will be, carry on with this utter chaos and damage under the Tory party, 
or usher in a Labour government. That binary argument might wash south of the border, Sir Key, but up here there is a third choice, which is break away from the union. Do you think the people of Scotland should have the right to determine their own future or not? Well, look, I'm talking about priorities and what is the priority at the moment. And for me, the priority is the economy. But that is the Peter central issue. The, electorate that the, the way to solve I, that is to, to vote for independence, I, and people are backing that in their droves. I fundamentally... Uh, reject the argument. Do you, do you think the union is a voluntary organisation or are we stuck in it? Well, of course it's a voluntary organisation. So how, what's the democratic but route? That, I asked you if it was a voluntary union and you said you thought it was. So what is the democratic route out of that union? Well, look, if one nation doesn't want to be part of it anymore. A lot of people don't agree with you and they want out. Are they stuck in it? Well, of course they're not stuck so in how it. Do you, what's the democratic They're not route stuck out? in it, but this is about priorities. 50% of Scotland country. might disagree with that fundamentally and think the priority is independence. What well, do you say to them? There, this, 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 the SNP have won every single election at every level in Scotland for 15 years. What do you say to the voter who has voted for them in every election because they want independence and are now being told, well, uh, we know better than you? I, I'll tell you what I would say. I, I just don't accept that. I just don't accept that. It's not, I mean, I was shocked, Lloyd, that the BBC... Hats off, Mr. Geisler. Absolutely roasted them and exposed them for the, la the lack of de democracy. You know, it, it doesn't matter what you vote, you'll get what we give you. Uh, just an absolute reason why we need to get to, out of this union. Absolutely. No, no hats off to Martin Geisler. Uh, I worked with Martin on a, a number of quite gritty documentaries in the, the mid-90s. And Martin's a a bloody good correspondent and a very, very good journalist, which is why he spent a lot of time working for ITN in Europe and in the United States. You know, Martin's got his own his own politics, but he's not a stupid guy. And if you stick somebody in front of him, a bit like with Bernard Ponsonby as well, if you stick somebody in front of him who tries to flannel him and tries to talk about things that Martin knows more about, then you ain't going to get far. That's just a fact. But as far as Stammer's concerned, we give him too much airtime. The fact of the matter is, this is the man who put Julian Assange in jail. This is the man who fully supports the genocidal behaviour of the Israeli government in Gaza. Right? I'm sorry, those two things alone preclude that man from frontline politics, but not in the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland, because he's a safe pair of hands for the city of London and the British establishment. That's what's mm. been done here. We're being played again. I mean, in reality, has Boris Johnson told more lies than Keir Starmer, or has Keir Starmer told more lies than Boris Johnson? I think you probably find that they're both equal at the top of the, the top of the, the charts on that one. A despicable individual who knows little or nothing about this country. He can barely remember because he lies so much. He can barely remember what he said yesterday. But he has that. In some ways, he's got elements of John Swinney about him. You know that look. That tells you that he supposedly, it's called that supposedly it. hey, the look that he's, he's supposedly supposedly honest. The Labour Party are going to win seats in Scotland. That's a fact. But they're not winning them because Keir Starmer's a great leader and that they're producing great policies. It will be done by the default of people staying at home because they yeah. are no longer believe that going out and voting for the political parties. And, and this has become true in Scotland because primarily of the actions of the Scottish National Party, not anybody else, but let's hope they go out and they vote for independence for independence. But any gains that Labour makes, if they start crowing for the rooftops, and people need to remind them they're coming from effectively having run this country for nearly 80 years before the creation of the Scottish Parliament, you know, they've been reduced to nothing, and they were reduced to nothing by being unprincipled, and showing to the people that they were unprincipled, and the people went, nah, we're not having it anymore. Any mm. blip for Labour this time round is a direct result of the incompetence of the Scottish National Party government. And what they have to understand and learn from the circumstances, they need to get back to competent government. But it's not going to happen under John Swinney. That's, 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 that's just a, a fact. He's owned yeah. by too many people. He owes too many people. And more importantly than that, 25 years after the creation of the Scottish Parliament, we have come to the boundaries of what is possible within devolution. It is not possible to deliver more. 
that's the problem. That has, all, that has been the problem from day one because we should have seen this coming as people in other devolved administrations or in other areas that were devolved before us, they realised when they came to the point where you can go no further. Now, if there is no one in the Scottish National Party that, that actually understands that to address the social problems that are all around you, you can see them, look out of any window of any town in any town, city, village in the country. The problems are out there. If you don't have the tools to address those problems, then you've got to find where the tools are. And ultimately, as we know, the tools can only be got by controlling our own natural resources and our human resources to deliver for the people of the country. And that requires independence. And anybody, but anybody that's in politics who says, oh, well, we could do more with devolution. You will come to a point where you can do no more. And I would suggest we are at that point now. And most importantly, this is part of the apathy of the voters out there. The voters know that too. Yeah. Um, the one thing you did miss out um, was that he didn't, he didn't prosecute Jimmy Savile. That was another one of Mr. Stammer. You missed that one out. Um, we should have put, I'm just checking, Techie, we do have, I'm sure, um, another one, uh, the Joanna Cherry um, put out a tweet this week, which I kept, which was a cracker, because Starmer was demanding, Derek, that uh, uh, we have a we have an election um, in Scotland because he put it to, and it was necessary in Wales, uh, but in Scotland because we changed the leader. Funnily enough, Labour changed their leader in Wales. We didn't think it was necessary then to have a, a general election in Wales. Funny that, isn't it? There you go. I knew we had it. Mm. We should choose a new... We, uh, the Scottish should choose and we should have an election, but they didn't want one in Wales. Yeah. Just the continuing hypocrisy we get from the Unionists, isn't it, Derek? Absolutely is. Yeah, continuing... Um hypocrisy from unionists absolutely yeah i mean um I made, I made a comment earlier that the politicians have had their day and what i should have said is the, pol the political parties have had their day with probably with the exception of the isp um because the the people that are now standing in politics the the independents and that, i would i would probably um, bring the isp into this particular comment as well None of them are actually politicians. None of them even want to be politicians. But nobody they want... is until they become one, Derek. That's the exactly whole thing. this is this is true. You have to be yeah, you have to be careful you don't get sucked in. Um yeah, I could get I could get dragged into another conversation about getting dragged in and getting the old um concrete boots put down and around your feet in, in, in Westminster. That's another show entirely. But um, Keir Starmer and that mob, wow, they're, they're just one and the same. It's one homogenous lump down there, and none of them are in. None of them are actually interested in the the common good, the uh, the the good of the people. Um, none of it. Where do you start with it all? It's just a total mess, and we need new direction. I mean, you just got to look at what Keir Starmer did to Jeremy Corbyn. That was an assassination of character and all all sorts. The you know the anti was it anti you know Zionism and all that. They changed they changed the definition to suit themselves. I mean, you just got to take a look at some of the the things that are out there. There's a really good documentary that's just actually. Um, been out the last few weeks, and it's and it's very much in the same vein as the Labour Files, Al Jazeera, and it's sort of you know I, I can't stress enough for people to take a look back at that, and you'll really see the corruption and the horror that's actually underneath the Keir Starmers of this world, um, and all the all the politics that's going on down there, and um, yes, yeah, Scotland just needs to run as fast as their legs will carry them in the opposite direction, and then um, the people are looking for a, a vehicle to do that. Hmm. Indeed. Um, we're running out of time here. A couple of things I want to get in. Uh, and the first one is, Techie, could you stick up that? I think Mark sent you a, this definitely. Uh, the Scottish Parliament on Friday voted for full compensation for the Waspies. Quite rightly so. Except Labour abstained. The same Labour Party that stopped the women in, in Glasgow getting their money, they abstained and compensating in full the waspy women. 
quite disgusting. And I think the SN the Labour vote is kind of soft. And I think if the SNP could only get their act together with the rest of the independence movement, Eva, with, dare I say, your favourite tune, a Scottish constitutional convention, we could absolutely. absolutely wipe them out, couldn't we? We would be able to. I mean, the WASPy stuff is just another disgrace. Um, where Labour talk the talk, but they don't walk the walk. Um, the WASPy women have been, in effect, they've been stolen from, and that just don't know what to have happened and their funds should be reinstated. There is no doubt about that. Um, there's always plenty of money for wars, etc., in the United Kingdom, oh, yeah. but there's not enough money for the people that deserve it. Um, but what we'd say in relation to, to the SNP and the independence movement, though, is that Nicola Sturgeon just actually hammered another nail into the coffin of the unity that we need when she commented, I think it was yesterday, about yeah. how yeah. misogyny is on the rise and there's a pushback against women's rights. This is an area that quite correctly Ash Reagan brought up in the context of her attempted negotiations with Yusuf. You cannot, as a former First Minister and a female, suggest that you are blameless in the context of there being pushback relative to women's rights when Miss Sturgeon, as the First Minister, was responsible for handing women's rights over to men. Yeah. You know, there's, there's a clue there. Um, she was responsible for the gender recognition reform legislation and she was responsible for instructing solicitors to argue in court that a gender recognition certificate changed your sex for all lawful purposes. She's responsible for rewriting history. She's responsible for guidance, as we touched on earlier and often on many other programmes, about guidance for schools, prisons, hospitals, you name it. You cannot allow men to muscle in on women's issues without expecting there to be a pushback. She's the woman who said that women's views at times were not valid. She supported a man working in a rape crisis centre and she was supported by a cohort of her colleagues, many of whom remain in ministerial positions in the Scottish Government, who were happy to repeat like demented parrots. Trans women are women. Mm. Trans women are not women. Trans women are men who might choose to identify as women. Female, they are not and they never will be. So if anybody can be singled out as being responsible for a pushback against women's rights or for misogyny, it's Nicola Sturgeon because it was her government that refused to include misogyny in the hate crime legislation and we're still waiting for the promised misogyny legislation, which is long overdue, but which unfortunately will include within the definition of victim, a trans identifying male. That blame, again, lies fairly and squarely at Miss Sturgeon's feet. And the problem with her and all the other women round about her that support her is they are entirely out of touch with the vast majority of the women of Scotland who are working class women who will see the inside of the refuges in the NHS wards and the prisons that Miss Sturgeon and her cronies never ever will unless, like the late Queen, there's a red carpet laid down in front of them and everywhere smells of fresh paint. Yeah. Um, we're at the end of our show. There's a couple of things I want to go up quickly. Um, Techie, can you stick up the picture of the English election results? Because I want to bring this, especially for you and Eva and Derek, as some encouragement. You'll see there that 78 independent increased votes, 78 new independent candidates. Um, Labour got 99. But the point was that the, the Liberal Democrats and the Greens together didn't get as many as independents. Now, I know there's in, a lot of independents stand in local elections, but a 78, there seems to be you know, a movement towards independence for independence. So that should be encouraging for you. And the last thing I want to go now, Scotland's kind of screwed up, Lloyd. It's a bit of a mess. We know that. We've got problems. But over there in America, they're about to lose their First Amendment rights because they've brought in a new law that says if you say any criticism, you can be as critical as you like of Biden or Trump, but if you're critical of Netanyahu, that's anti-Semitism. You can say what you like about America, but if you say anything about Israel, it's anti-Semitism. But the best one yet I've got, is, could you get that video ready, um, Techie? This is the chief economic advisor. Now, America is the, the 
the global powerhouse, the financial center of the world for the Western world. This is who we depend upon to look after our financial well-being, Lloyd. Hit that video for us. This, remember, is Mr. Biden's chief economic advisor. The U.S. government can't go bankrupt because we can print our own money. It obviously begs the question, why exactly are we borrowing in a currency that we print ourselves? I'm waiting for someone to stand up and say, why don't we borrow our own currency in the first place? Like you said, they print the dollar. So why, why does the government even borrow? Well, um, the, uh, so the, I mean, again, some of this stuff gets, some of the language that the MN, some of the language and concepts are just confusing. I mean, the government definitely prints money and it definitely lends that money, which is why uh, the government definitely prints money and then it lends that money by, uh, by selling bonds. Uh, is that what they do? They, they, um, they, yeah, they, they, um, they sell bonds. Yeah, they sell bonds, right? Because they sell bonds and people buy the bonds and lend them the money. Yeah, so a lot of times, a lot of times, at least to my ear with, with MMT, the, the language and the concepts can be kind of unnecessarily confusing, but there is no question that the government prints money and then it uses that money to, um, uh, 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 so, um, yeah, I, I guess I'm just I don't I can't really talk I don't I don't get it I don't know what they're talking about like because it's like the government clearly prints money it does it all the time and it clearly borrows otherwise we wouldn't be having this debt and deficit conversation so I don't think there's anything confusing there. <laughs> the chief economic advisor Lloyd, you feeling better now? Do you, I mean, the world can save hands. Have you ever? <laughs> See that in your life? It's a plague. It's America. What do you expect? It's a you know welcome to the monkey house. Um, why should we be surprised? You know the great Gore Vidal told us many, many, many years ago that the American, the <coughs> the Zionist military-industrial complex runs America, and uh, no one can say anything against it. What's horrifying is that we, as people in other parts of the world, seem to think that there's something nice and cuddly about America, and that just simply isn't true, as we've seen from the behaviour of the police forces across the campuses of the United States over the past few days. Um, you have to laugh or you cry, but honestly, anybody and everybody that's a, a voting citizen in a country that's an ally of the United States should watch that very video and maybe uh, inform themselves that... Uh, <coughs> Uncle Sam ain't your friend. But then yeah, again, just, Colonel Ann Wright, Colonel Ann Wright told us that in the programme over seven months ago. Uncle Sam did, is not your friend. So remember that, folks, that um, the government prints money, yeah, yeah, it does that, and it, it, it lends the money and, um, it bought, it bought, yeah, it bought and, and prints money, definitely prints money, yep. That's all you need to know about economics. That was the Chief Economic Advisor. Fantastic. You'll, rest, you'll sleep better now. Folks, we've come to the end of today's show. Uh, I want to thank you for your input. Um, it's been fabulous as usual. Derek, I hope you'll not be a stranger. Um, and uh, we'll see you as the campaign grows, etc. on, the, uh, on the, the UK general election. Eva, Lloyd, as always, thank you so much. And to you folks for watching and putting up with us, thank you very much. And until we see you again, please, please, take care. Okay, bye now. Through a Scottish Prism, the programme that is unapologetically pro-Scottish independence and anti-Westminster rule. Everything we say here is viewed through a Scottish Prism. Brought to you by Barhead Boy.